For me personally, it was important to say, I had a music group that I thought I had a vision for. Or I was entrusted with a gift from, from our elders that was actually reaching people in the way I hoped it would. It was giving pride, it was giving awareness, some of the music we wrote about. To show that there was a crossover that was possible with contemporary sounds plus some traditional audio elements, but also some of the lyrical subject matter was writing from an indigenous perspective. Much of the music that Eagle and Hawk put together over the years was really about saying, we have a valid point of view about all of these things, and here it is, and listen to it, and at the same time, enjoy the music. As we did some gigs with Eagle and Hawk in the last two years, did I ever realize that Eagle and Hawk is something special? There's a bond, there's a brotherhood, there's a collective spirit, there's a conviction, there's a passion, there's an embrace. You stand up there and try to remember that moment because you, you just never know, right? And it's just a, a great opportunity like to be able to to still be playing and, and having people actually coming out and wanting to hear what we're what we're doing. It's great. My good friend, it's time to celebrate. Have a voice in the mainstream. You can share a message, whether it's you know suicide or awareness for different things, and you have that opportunity to have that. It's reciprocated well by people because it's through music and music is universal. It's like the universal language through everything. To share. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In 2017, we got asked to be part of a Canada 150 train, which was kind of ironic because, you know, it's Canada 150, but we did it. I wanted to have that Indigenous voice part of Canada 150. And I'll tell you, we brought the Indigenous theme again to these Canadians. Twenty years is a long time for an uh, unsigned band to be able to continue to tour. Most industry, there's some ebb and flow and you're up and you're down and completely natural to go, oh man, what are we going to do? Should we uh, settle down or should we kick it up a notch. I remember listening to Eagle and Hawk and the message was fundamentally about being proud of being Indigenous. It was about reclaiming that Indigenous space and that Indigenous spirit within yourself but also within the broader community. And when you live in, in Winnipeg, no matter who you are, you are immersed in Indigenous space. Here we are, Canada Day, uh, the Forks, the Odena Circle, actually, uh, the historic meeting place of uh, Indigenous people for hundreds and thousands of years. Uh, we like to think Winnipeg is really the center of Turtle Island, which is North America. So a lot of the changes have started right here at the Forks. I started thinking older artists can put out albums. And I still have the guys in the band, Jay and Spatch. Eagle and Hawk has got a voice. Then as we rounded the corner into 20 years, I thought, why not make this a marker? You start thinking, well, what does that mean? Okay, so we have a party, CD release with the best of. I've known Eagle and Hawk for a long time. The particular thing of Canada is that we all have roots, but we blend those roots very easily. We're not slavishly faithful to the style of music we emulate. Canadian audiences are very open to hybrids, to blends, to whatever anybody wants to do with the music. And that's, I think, a good thing. Very special treat. Please put your hands together for our very good friend, Mr. Brian Klein. I think my first takeaway was 
like, whoa. Like, they had this energy, they had this urgency, and it reminded me of what was happening in the punk movement of the latter part of the 70s. And when I listen to a band, I want to hear something that touches me emotionally, that can take me somewhere. And I was touched emotionally when I saw Eagle and Hawk. from law school in 1979 thinking that no one was listening to us, no one was hearing us, no one was paying attention to what we were saying. We had so much to say and we had such a need to be heard. Uh, how were we going to get our voices heard? Music has been a, a great vehicle. growing up, I found myself in North Caldona with non-Indigenous friends, and they kind of liked me for who I was. I was just a regular kid. I didn't get the gig in the band, but that was kind of the feeling you got as a Native person. Susan Glowcart was huge. She was big, and Buffy St. Marie. People who kicked down some of the doors and blazed some of the trails. Tom Jackson, Billy Joe Green, Robbie Robertson, the Red Road Ensemble. It was awesome. And of course, legendary seaweed. Shin Goose. My good friend, it's time to sell. Kicking those doors open. He was a proud native who could sing, and he stood out because he looked native. But on TV, you know, you heard it, Redbone. Redbone, they just blew it wide open for people to see that it was possible. Contemporary sounds, traditional audio elements, writing from an indigenous perspective. I was in a band, I didn't want to be in it anymore. And they said, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to start an Aboriginal band. What's an Aboriginal band? No idea. I'm you know, trying to put the red lens through my spirit, in a sense, through my eyes to see where that would take me. At a club downtown, and there's this uh, young, good-looking guy, Troy Westwood. He's, hey, that's the football player. And he gets up to sing with a friend of mine's band, Shake Naked. He was like kind of a Native American Jim Morrison, CFL All-Star, right? I, I met Vince Fontaine and we started talking about music and we both, we had sort of a shared vision of the vibe and the feel that we wanted to create musically. It was a really beautiful thing to tap into. The first song we wrote was kind of a Led Zeppelin acoustic guitar riff, was Eagle and Hawk are my brothers. Eagle and Hawk are my brothers, up above where in your eyes. Melding traditional rock and folk type of vibe with First Nation sounds and freedom and, and strength to it and just a lot of unknown. Because of the inclusion of Troy Westwood at the beginning uh, was the fact that this was a group that came together to bring non-Indigenous and Indigenous people together, the Eagle and the Hawk maybe not pioneering, but there weren't very many people at that point in time were doing. It was fusing the, the sounds and the elements. So it was, it was almost like we were on the cusp of, of introducing a new genre of, of sorts. This was on the heels of things like Oka, climate, Mother Earth. These were things that were coming up through the indigenous voice. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Fine how we can share this voice collectively. Do you want to be in the Wild West show? You know, some of our booking agents, they thought, you guys are really good, right? So let's put you into the non-Indigenous bars. It's like, I don't know if folks had ever seen top 40 A circuit band that was all Native Bellows. And all of a sudden, this door opened to me to start going to Europe. And we had a tour, and then we had a CD release opportunity with a, with a distributor. To be there purely and solely as an entertainer 
was really, really cool for me from a creative and artistic standpoint. The impact of that first European tour that we took was profound on me. June rolls around of 97 and Troy calls me up and says, well, training camp starts, I can't really, that's it. You know, there was a fork there. Would have stayed with Eagle and Hawk and left football behind and it was one thing. And then the dream of playing for my hometown team, the Bombers too, was also really big. In the meantime, Jody Gaskin was touring in Europe and said, hey Vince, you wanna come play guitar for me? So I'm like, yeah, I'll come to Europe in 97, why not? 21 shows in 25 days in November of 1997. Jody knew, I think, that he had his music vision and he had his own product and I still wanted to do the Eagle and Hawk, whatever that meant. Which I started feeling like Eagle and Hawk was like an entrusted vision and it would become a vehicle, almost like a car. I was in the front seat and I had the, the keys to drive and who wants to sit in the front? Vince was looking for a singer to go on one tour of Europe. And really, it was like dipping a toe in the water. I'm just going to try to fill Troy's shoes for this tour. My first three years in the band, there was always another little tour coming up. From Paris to Zurich to Berlin to Warsaw, and you name it. I never seen folks come out and want to be an Indian. Never saw that in my life. It was incredible. Just in full regalia, right? Leathers and feathers looking at us going, what's this, you know? They had this huge teepee set up, and I was like, a teepee set up in Zurich, Switzerland? It was like, okay, sure. Not only are you deconstructing ideas at home, you're also doing it in Europe, right? the opportunity to actually be in Europe at the same time as Eagle and Hawk. And I remember just watching all of these Europeans, these, these white people, losing their mind and dancing and singing and looking at all of the men that were on the stage, visibly indigenous men that were on the stage and thinking, they're so loved and adored here, but back in Canada, they are viewed very differently. Can't get to the salon? You can still look and feel your best with Finishing Touch Flawless Brows. The precision hair remover that painlessly sweeps away unwanted brow hair. No redness or irritation. Salon style results at home. Available at fine retailers everywhere. The Battle of the St. Lawrence wasn't just fought with soldiers. It was fought with soldiers like M.L. Gagnon, a lieutenant, a husband, a butter maker. Beyond every battle is a family story. Discover yours at Ancestry.ca. Think prevention with the Prevnar 13 vaccine. My risk of a potentially serious disease has gone up. That's why I did it. After 50, ask your doctor, nurse, or pharmacist about Prevnar 13. Don't let the risk of pneumococcal pneumonia ruin your groove. Mr. Speaker, I stand before you today to offer an apology to former students of Indian residential schools. The, the apology was huge. When Truth and Reconciliation came out as a conversation and an issue, people were more and more aware that Native people, Indigenous people were present in Canada. In the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I chaired, we wrote about reconciliation being the development of a mutually respectful relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. But we also said that before we can have a mutually respectful relationship, we must first recognize the importance of giving to young indigenous people their sense of self-respect.
They have to feel a sense of pride, not merely because we tell them they have to be proud, but we have to show them, and we're doing that, and we do that best through music. We now have this population of young people who are feeling a sense of not just pride about the reality of their past, but also a sense of responsibility to that past, which is carrying the weight on their shoulders, as the song talked about. Arriving at this point, when I'm writing an album or thinking about an album, it's kind of like the vehicle again. We're going down the road and I all of a sudden bring Chris Bergaffi in the front seat and Jay and we talk about the album. I start talking about some ideas and themes. The album that we're going to write is about liberty. The discussion on what freedom is. And freedom is such a big word. And it's also, in a sense, from the red, I see red perspective, coming the whole wave of people. We have so many discussions about immigration and freedom. She's not afraid to take her throne. No. It's just reminding people that, hey, everybody came through the gate, the portal to the new world, the new dream, the American dream. But the Native American folks were already there being the entrusted caretakers of the land. Working on some Eagle and Hawk tracks, and it's always fun because uh, these guys are uh, super talented. They're also my pals, so we always have a good time. No longer only flesh and bone. Oh, she's come of age. You know, like instead of laid more, she sees the world to the different eye. We want to proclaim that she's come of age in a sense. She walks a battlefield with a bear clan. Salvation Army boots to take a stand. Up Pritchard Avenue to the promised land. residential school issues. Um, of course, you know, today, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is such a huge issue, which we attribute directly and indirectly to the experience of colonization and which is preceding the conversation of truth and reconciliation. Musicians really set the stage for politicians, absolutely, in terms of acceptance and understanding and the growth of our community into a positive part of Canada's development as a nation. We're very much part of the scene. At this point, we are where we ought to be, but that's not to suggest that's where we remain. There's still all kinds of opportunities for growth, meaning we have to encourage and support young people, and there are many. We really had to fight to belong. We had to fight to feel that we belonged. We now have our own protest music to declare that we belong. That has taken us some time to do. And I give Eagle and Hawk full credit for being at the cusp of that right at the beginning. opportunity for our people, for youth, for elders to actually see themselves 
reflected in music that was being played on the radio, that you could buy CDs, that you could see in concerts, that you could see at treaty days, that you could see on Canada Day. We won, I think, like 33, 34 awards with Eagle and Hawk. I started realizing winning an award or getting a nomination is just like putting a little fuel in the tank and never taken for granted. Eagle and Hawk gives me an opportunity to continue to play music, which every day I wake up and I, I'm like, we're playing in Paris, we're playing with the symphony, we're playing at the Olympics, you know. Pretty amazing to have been given this opportunity. Much like sort of the society we live in, right, the music and the artist community, there's all kinds of individuals out there that can, that have these wonderful gifts. And Vince is just quick to bring someone into the circle that can contribute and, and do something positive to the body of Eagle and Hawk. Lots of non-Indigenous members, we've had lots of Indigenous members, and it just kind of became this real cool family. There's something truly special, important, and sacred there that a lot of people could benefit from to come to a deeper understanding of and how far that has traveled is magnificent, but there is a long, long way to go still. It can't be an easy journey when you are among the first in that realm. It can't be an easy journey. It's a bit of a in-your-face sort of thing, saying, you have ignored us all these years and look what we have. Look what you don't know about. And it's, it's uh, something that would have made you a better person if you had only listened. There's been many times in the past two, three years I thought, oh, you know, should I make an announcement? Eagle and Hawk is retired, it's finished. And my spirit and conviction would go, no. 